This Week at NASA. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a treat. NASA television helped observe the last transit of Venus we'll see here on Earth until 2117 by showcasing live streaming websites the world over, including observations made by scientists in Central Australia. There are just a few clouds in the sky and we are set up for an absolutely gorgeous first and second contact. And by the NASA EDGE team stationed atop the Mauna Kea Observatory okay. in Hawaii. I'm going to look until I put my blinders down. Yes. And now, well, of course, now I can't see anything. Scientists at NASA headquarters also provided information and insight about this rare yet predictable celestial phenomenon that has captivated humankind for millennia. From a perspective of wanting to know more about our solar system, here's an occurrence like an eclipse that's very rare, and of course it attracts our natural interest in looking at these uh, wandering objects and where they go, and in this case, uh, Venus is gonna cross in front of the sun. If I could actually dream 105 years, 117 years from now, I wouldn't think about uh, the transit of Venus. What do you think about transit of Earth as seen from Mars? And NASA helped provide some unique images. This is how the transit appeared to astronaut Don Pettit from his vantage point on board the International Space Station. And NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory captured the entire transit in stunning greater than HD resolution. Several NASA centers hosted public transit viewing parties. At the Ames Research Center, close to 6,000 people came to watch the sky and broadcast, plus ask questions of Kepler mission and planetary scientists. No matter where they were, those who witnessed the transit were treated to a last in our lifetime event. Hi, I'm Gay Yi Hill at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. About a half dozen of our JPLers have brought in their own personal telescopes equipped with solar filters so they can share this once in a lifetime event with some of their co-workers and also people who live in the neighborhood. I saw the sun, but I saw this tiny black dot, but I couldn't I couldn't say it at first, but then I looked closer, and then I saw the tiny black dog, and I knew that was Venus. What surprised me about it most was the fact that, I guess, that I was able to see it in my lifetime. What are you going to do, tell your grandkids about this? Assuming I have any. <laughs> it's really cool. You can see it through, and if, this, if, and if you can look closely, there's like a really, really extremely tiny black dot, which is Venus. If you missed this one, that's okay. There's another one coming. Unfortunately, it's uh, 105 years away. So you can understand why these kids are stoked that they just witnessed something that happens just once in a lifetime. As NASA joined the world to witness the Venus transit, Officials at the Glenn Research Center hosted media representatives to learn about and see some of the capabilities developed to pave the way for future robotic missions to Venus. The event began in a lab where engineers rapidly create various space exploration concepts, some of which involve flying in the Venus sky. Glenn researchers summarized Glenn's capabilities for future Venus missions and gave a briefing on what a Venus rover could look like. They also talked about their excitement in observing the Venus transit and working with scientists around the world to better understand what happens on Venus and what that may mean for us here on Earth. The climate models that we currently use on Earth only have Earth as a set of data to validate. Venus will provide a new set of validation that will allow us to improve our weather prediction capabilities. Reporters also toured Glenn's new extreme environment rig that will simulate harsh environments of planets like Venus. This rig is the largest of its kind in the world. This extreme environments rig truly is an extreme environments rig. It can handle harsh, high pressure, high temperature, but also the conditions such as on Titan, where it's cold and yet pressurized, and some of the new planets that are being discovered, such as exoplanets that are a little larger than Earth, but have very similar conditions to Venus. One of the areas that we're working uh, is a seismometer that can measure the uh, vibrations on the Venus surface. This seismometer is meant to be able to withstand harsh environments of Venus and actually operate on the Venus surface. 
A little more than a month after arriving at New York's JFK Airport atop a NASA 747 shuttle carrier aircraft, Space Shuttle Enterprise concluded its voyage when NASA's first space shuttle made its much anticipated arrival by way of barge on the Hudson River to its new home, the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. Enterprise will be on exhibit to the public beginning July 19th in a temporary climate-controlled pavilion. Intrepid continues work on a permanent exhibit facility to showcase Enterprise and enhance the museum's space-related exhibits and education curriculum. To celebrate 100 years of the Girl Scouts, NASA helped the organization rock the National Mall by hosting an event at NASA headquarters in Washington. Scouts were treated to an engaging program that included hands-on activities to learn about aeronautics, science, and exploration. They also learned about NASA's missions and careers from special guests that included former NASA astronauts Heidi Marie Stephanie Piper and Pam Melroy and NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garber. The organization, the Girl Scouts, strives to teach girls self-reliance and resourcefulness. It also encourages girls to seek fulfillment in the professional world and to become active citizens in their communities. In my experience, there are no better skills than those to prepare you for the future. It was great talking to a group of Girl Scouts, telling them all about the things, the neat stuff you can do with math and science whether it's uh, in the Navy fixing ships or flying in space and building a space station. This long tube shape may not look like a spacecraft to most people, but something like it may someday take instruments to Mars or return cargo to Earth. Packed into its restraining bag is rv 3 the inflatable reentry vehicle experiment developed at NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. It's designed to demonstrate that inflatable spacecraft are feasible. It's very challenging to develop an inflatable spacecraft because you have to use materials that do not mind being packed down into a small volume for launch and then unfolded up to their full size. So we use fabrics, whereas a traditional rigid heat shield would be more of a solid material that doesn't fold. Irv-3 is scheduled to launch from a sounding rocket at Wallops Flight Facility, also in Virginia, much like its predecessor Irv-2 did in 2009. But first, the hardware and software has had to go through a series of tests. One of the last destinations before flight, NASA Langley's Transonic Dynamics Tunnel, or TDT, to check out the whole system, inflation and all. We were using the TDT for a vacuum chamber, and what we do is actually bring it down to low pressure, just like it'll see during re-entry, to make sure that this thing's going to inflate properly. But during the test, we had the um, pyro initiators, which are little cutters that they don't explode or anything, they just cut the strings. Um, they initiated, the bag started to unzip, it actually paused, so we all got excited for a minute, and then it just paused a second and let, let go, and the rest of the bag opened up, the inflatable came out. That was much to the relief of the engineers, who thoroughly checked the Irv-3 afterwards. Also performing well during the test, the thermal blanket, which will protect the inflatable from the forces and heat of atmospheric entry. Now the team can only hope everything works just as flawlessly later this year in space. And continue to study your math and science, because one day we're gonna need your help. The Marshall Space Flight Center and Boeing teamed up with the city of Huntsville to share a bit of the International Space Station with some 5,000 students. Huntsville Mayor Tommy Battle's book club provided the students with a copy of station-inspired Living in Space. The club provides children from low-income neighborhoods with books they can keep. Marshall's Space Launch Systems Manager Tony Lavoie and astronauts Mike Fink and Jack Fisher talked with students about the work being done together by NASA and Boeing on the new SLS, and the groundbreaking science and technology conducted aboard the ISS that continues to benefit the world. When I was 12 years old, I decided I was going to be a writer. The NASA family mourns the passing of Ray Bradbury, one of our era's greatest and most noted science fiction fantasy writers. 
As the author of such classic works as The Martian Chronicles, The Illustrated Man, and Fahrenheit 451, Bradbury influenced a generation of young men and women who dared to dream of making science fiction science fact. The future of mankind depends upon space travel and they will get away from war. If we stay on Earth, we'll go on having wars. But if we go to the moon and Mars, we'll bind ourselves together into one single race, one color, and go into space and live forever. Ray Bradbury was 91. One year ago, on June 10th, 2011, NASA's Age of Aquarius dawned with the launch of an international satellite carrying the Aquarius Observatory from California's Vandenberg Air Force Base. Aquarius was designed to take NASA's first space-based measurements of the salinity, or saltiness, of Earth's oceans to further our understanding of the global water cycle and improve climate forecasts. Aquarius was built by the Jet Propulsion Lab and the Goddard Space Flight Center. And 45 years ago, on June 14, 1967, the Mariner 5 spacecraft was launched by an Atlas Agena D rocket from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station towards the planet Venus. Making its flyby on October 19th of that year with instruments more sensitive than its predecessor, Mariner 2, Mariner 5 shed new light on the hot, cloud-covered planet and on conditions in interplanetary space. Its operations ended in November of 1967. Mariner 5 remains in orbit around the sun. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, or to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, log on to www.nasa.gov.